If you knew for a fact that you only had a month or maybe a year left to live, what would you do? Where would you go? What would you want to do? Is there anything you'd want to make right before the end? That's what it means to live like you're dying. Now in the song, Tim McGraw says this, I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And then he says this, and I loved deeper, I spoke sweeter, and I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. Now think about those terms. I loved deeper, I spoke sweeter, and I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. All of those are relationship issues. And if you and I are really going to live like we're dying, we need to focus on our human relationships around us, on people that God's placed strategically in our lives. That's one of the great legacies of life that will outlive us when we're gone. What we mean to other people. How would you like for people to remember you? When your life is over, when it's all said and done, when you've gone to heaven, what would you like for people to remember about you? Let's zero in on that this morning as we talk about what it means to live like we're dying. Now, first of all, when we live like we're dying, we're basically going to focus on people. We're going to focus on other people. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is on his way to Jerusalem, and he knew, he knew in his heart this was going to be a treacherous journey. He knew that probably he'd wind up be arrest, being arrested. He knew that probably he's going to stand trial and eventually would cost him his very life, all because of the fact he was a believer in Jesus Christ. Did you know it's still that way in many parts of the world? Recently in the Sudan, three missionaries for Samaritan's Purse were arrested. Why? For carrying the gospel in the name of Jesus to people who need to hear the word of God. And as far as I know, according to the latest reports, they're still under arrest. And there's not been much in the news about this, but here are three missionaries in the name of Jesus who've been arrested in the Sudan, a place that hates Christianity and hates the cause of Jesus Christ. Paul had that experience. And Paul decided on his way to Jerusalem to face these consequences of being a believer that he would stop at Miletus and just call for the elders or the spiritual leaders of the church at Ephesus. They were very dear to him. And he wanted to meet with them one last time because he was living like he was dying. Look at verse 25 again. Paul says, And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see my face again. The Apostle Paul literally was living like he was dying. He was saying goodbye to people that he loved very dearly, to people who had played an instrumental role in his life, that he had played an instrumental role in their life. And how did they respond? In verse 36 and verse 38, the Bible says they fell on the ground, they prayed together, and there was a great deal of weeping that took place on that occasion. Now, think about this. When Paul eventually did die as a martyr for the cause of Christ, what do you think these people from Ephesus who met with him in Miletus, what do you think they remembered most about him? I think they probably remembered that he loved them so much that he took time out of his busy schedule on his way to Jerusalem facing unknown circumstances just to share with them a few precious moments. I believe they would remember that and think about it. They would remember the last words that he said just to encourage them in their faith. They would remember hugging him and giving him a kiss of Christian fellowship. They would remember the tears on that occasion, the tears of that day, the tears of sadness that they would never see him face to face again. It was a moving time. It was a meaningful time, this encounter between the Apostle Paul and those that he loved so dearly. Now, I don't really think these people were concerned very much about what Paul was wearing on that day. They probably wouldn't remember what color tunic he had on or where he bought it, whether he paid a lot of money for it or just a little bit of money. I don't think they'd remember very much about the cabin that he had on the ship, whether it was first class or low class or no class, that really didn't matter. I don't think they'd really remember his education, although Paul was a highly educated man, a man of degrees. I believe the most important thing that these people would remember about Paul was him. They would simply remember him. And those last moments together in Miletus would stand out in their mind and stay with them for the rest of their lives. Let me ask you a question this morning. Think about the year that you graduated. Now some of you, it's been recent, or maybe it's been years and years and years ago, but think about the year 
that you graduated, whatever year that was, the year you graduated from high school. Can you name the person who won the Academy Award that year for the best actor? The year you graduated. Or what about the Grammy? What about the Grammy for the song of the year? Can you remember who won that in the year that you graduated from high school? How about this one? Who won the World Series that year? Or who won the ACC that year? Can you remember any of that? Probably not. I know I can't. I graduated in 1972. And I can't remember any of that information. But then let me ask you this. Do you remember any one teacher or maybe a coach who really impacted your life while you were in high school? Now a lot of heads would nod on that one because that's what stands out in our mind. Not who won the Grammy or who won the Academy Award or who won the World Series or who won the ACC, but really those people that impacted our lives personally. And what makes the difference? They made a personal impression on your life and you'll never forget them for that. Now I believe that's the kind of legacy that you and I need to leave behind when we start living like we're dying. We'll start focusing on people that God has placed around us in our lives. Now there's no doubt that the Apostle Paul was a people person. When he closes out his epistles and those letters that he's written to various people in various churches, he always lists a long list of names, people that he knew, people that he wanted to greet, people that sent greetings to other people that he knew. And so Paul was a people person. Jesus Christ, our Savior, was also a people person. In fact, the Bible says that he was a friend of sinners. And they meant that really as something detrimental. They were criticizing him. Here's a guy who claims to be the Messiah, and he's hanging around with sinners. And yet I think it was the greatest compliment they could ever pay Jesus. I, for one, am glad that he's a friend of sinners because if he was not a friend of sinners, he couldn't be my friend. And he probably couldn't be your friend because all of sin may come short of the glory of God. But Jesus was a friend of sinners. He was a people person. Can I urge you to do something? If you're going to live like you're dying, if you're going to make your life really count in the lives of others, don't ever get so busy or so preoccupied that you miss the blessing of people that God has placed around you. The relationships that are so important in life, that's a legacy we're going to leave behind. Paul did, and you will, and I will also. And so when we live like we're dying, we'll focus on people. Here's the second thing. When we live like we're dying, we'll focus on purpose. We'll focus on purpose in our lives. A few weeks ago when I was preaching, I started talking about phobias and fears, and I talked about all the various phobias that are out there. Just shortly after that, I read a Gallup poll, and then a Gallup poll, they asked this question, what do you fear most in your life? And when I read that question that they asked hundreds and hundreds of different people, what do you fear most in life? I thought to myself, well, the most prominent answer is probably going to be, I fear snakes, or I fear spiders, or maybe I'm afraid that I'm going to be destitute and lose everything that I have. I, I'm afraid of the economy. Those would be great fears, and indeed those are tremendous fears that are out there. But do you know what the number one answer to that question was? What do you fear most in your life? The number one answer from Americans was simply this. We have the fear of coming to the end of our life without making a significant difference. That was the number one fear, according to the Gallup poll, that we're going to live our whole life and not really make a difference. Max Lucado calls that not mattering. Richard Foster calls it the fear of irrelevance. The fact that we just don't matter that much. It doesn't matter that we were ever born, that it doesn't matter that we ever really lived. That means we all need some purpose in our life. Some kind of a sense of purpose. Now, I believe that the Apostle Paul had a great sense of purpose. That's why he could live like he was dying, because he knew the purpose that he had. And he talks about that here in chapter 20 of the book of Acts. Look at verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and the trials that came to me. His goal, his purpose, was to serve the Lord. Verse 24, he also kind of hits on the same idea. He mentions finishing my course, finishing the purpose that God had set before him. Now, what was the purpose of Paul's life? Paul's purpose was to serve the Lord by serving other people in Jesus' name. 